Bonjour à tous. Good morning, uh, everybody, and welcome to this session of uh, Exxon Sen, devoted to finance, putting finance at the service of the ecological transition. How? Using what kind of uh, financing and regulation? These are the questions that we're going to answer during this uh, session, which, as usual, under the high patronage of a member of the Secle des Economistes, Jean-Paul uh, Paulin. We have our uh, guest, Maya Attig. Good morning. You're the general director of the uh, French Banking Federation. Sylvie Matara, you are a member of the High Level Forum and the EU Commission on Capital Market Union. Lord Adair Turner who is chairman of the Energy Transitions Commission. Hervé uh, Elias, you the uh, CEO of the uh, Mazar consultancy firm, and Hervé Ecué, you are a uh, lawyer and managing partner of the Allen and Overy firm. Um, we're very pleased to have all of you around this table, apart from Sir Lord Adair Turner, who will be uh, joining us by video conference. Jean-Paul uh, Paulin, as usual, it's up to you to give us our introduction to our debate. Over to you. Thank you, Emmanuel. The financial sector is really designed to make a decisive contribution to environmental transition because it has the power to guide the capitals it mobilizes towards activities and investments that should make it possible to correct the environmental problems that we can observe. Not only does it have the power, but it has an advantage. It's in its interest to do that because the disorders we're seeing are likely to eventually generate risks, which would be a threat to the stability of the banking system. And probably this would be extremely serious. So we can say that uh, after all, the financial system in other words, the contributors of capital and also the financial institutions of different kinds should uh, make sure that their decisions uh, correspond to the objectives that have been defined to ensure that we achieve this environmental uh, transition. We can observe that uh, in this area there are many, many different uh, initiatives that have been taken to put on the market different uh, kinds of new investment uh, products and the new financing, which makes it possible to meet this objective uh, of uh, environmental transition. We can also say that there have been so many initiatives of this kind that it's difficult to find your way sometimes. It needs to be clarified and also, above all, it uh, we need to have some kind of certification of these different products to avoid uh, the greenwashing phenomenon, where it consists in announcing something which it no, doesn't, in fact, have any kind of concrete effect. We also have to ask ourselves whether these uh, products are attractive enough compared to traditional products to make sure that this uh, orientation of the financing occurs spontaneously through uh, decisions made by the different stakeholders. Maybe there are, we could uh, say there is a few, a uh, bit of a doubt about that, but there are several reasons for that. First of all, because the horizon for financial decisions, it tends to be short or medium term, whereas the consequences of the environmental disruptions we're talking about are something that's going to be seen in the much longer term. So there's a behavioral bias here which has to be corrected. Another problem which I think has to be corrected is the fact that the environment is a common good. And it has externalities like any of the common good because the, the social profitability, the collective profitability and benefit of the investments in question, the activities in question, are greater than the private profitability, in other words, the profitability that uh, invest investors can benefit from. This is a perfectly conventional phenomenon of externalities, which we can correct uh, through price or uh, can be penalties on investments that uh, are high in uh, high carbon energy or uh, 
in order to promote these uh, green uh, business activities. To do that, we have to have some sort of public intervention and no longer allow free reign to private incentives. And these public interventions can be take uh, three different forms. First of all, monetary policies. Can monetary policies play a role? We know that central banks are highly mobilized in this area because they are concerned about the financial long-term stability of the economy. That having been said, monetary policy has other objectives, so it's rather complicated perhaps to combine these different objectives. So opinions may differ there. The second type of intervention is uh, prudential regulation, in other words, regulation by the financial institutions, whether it's uh, the banks or the insurance companies. and uh, asset management companies. It's a regulation of these different institutions. Uh, these institutions, when they take risks, they have to assume these risks. And when you assume a risk, this means you have to look at the resources, uh, the equity, to make sure you have enough equity and resources to be able to deal with the risks that may occur. And finally, the third type of uh, intervention is environmental policy, for example. the reduction of certain types of activity, the carbon price that we often talk about, that we haven't yet uh, succeeded in putting in place. This is another type of regulation that is outside the financial sector and which uh, no doubt needs to combine what uh, we see in the financial sector. But it is another story entirely but uh, this may be the, perhaps the most effective type of intervention. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Jean-Paul. We're now going to move on straight away to Lord uh, Turner. Can you hear us, Lord Turner? We oui, merci. Okay, okay good. Uh, Lord Turner, um, uh, I know thank that you, very you much understand for... French. Can I ask my question in French and you answer in English? Oui, c'est possible de ça. Je, 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 je voudrais parler en, euh, en anglais, mais c'est possible de réécouter. Yes, I want to speak English, but I can listen in French. L Lord Turner, you uh, highlight how much the greenhouse gas emissions are ambitious and attainable. But uh, to reach them, it, need, it requires a huge investments, which obviously need the support of the financial world. My question is easy. How can we get the financial world on board in this great adventure of transition? Can you hear me now? Très bien. Very well. I hope you can hear me, and I'd just like to say it's a great pleasure to be joining this discussion. Um, so I want to say a few words about the overall challenge of getting uh, to, uh, of dealing with climate change and the role in general of the financial system within that. And I speak as chair of an organization called the uh, Energy Transitions Commission, which is a global coalition of companies and climate change experts working across the world. We believe that to prevent potentially catastrophic climate change, the world needs to achieve net zero emissions by around 2050 in both developed and developing countries. And the good news is that that is undoubtedly technologically possible and that the economic cost of achieving it in terms of the reduction in attainable GDP per capita, the impact on living standards in 2050 is very small. And the increasing confidence that that is possible is reflected in the growing numbers of countries and companies which are making commitments to be net zero by 2050. And within the companies and sectors that are doing that, that includes from sectors which were previously thought of as being hard sectors uh, to reduce emissions in. I would point out recently a statement from ArcelorMittal, 
the steel company saying it will be net zero by 2050, or Maersk, uh, the major container shipping company, or from India, Dalmia Cement. Even in these hard sectors of the economy, we have many companies which are confident they can get there. But while it's absolutely technologically possible, it will require very large investments to get there. Figures from the International Energy Agency in their World Economic Outlook 2019 uh, estimated that by the 2030s, we would have to be investing about plus $1.8 trillion per annum across the world compared with a current levels of investment. Now, in fact, in global macroeconomic terms, that is not a problem. It amounts to only about 1% of likely GDP in that time, or about an increase of 3 to 4% of global savings and investments. And that's in a world where the underlying balance of attempted savings and in desired investment is today producing strongly negative real interest rates. Indeed, in the current situation, the need to invest more to drive the energy transition could even be considered positively welcome from a macroeconomic point of view. But these are still huge numbers, and underlying the net change in required investments, there are very big shifts from one sector to another. Those International Energy Agency World Economic Outlook figures show the need for 0.5 trillion, 500 billion less investment per annum in fossil fuels. 800 billion more investment per annum in zero carbon power generation, transmission and distribution. And interestingly, the biggest figure is plus 1.5 trillion, 1500 billion per annum in multiple forms of energy using equipment and also in buildings. And that reflects the fact that across the world, uh, investment is dominated by the investment which we put into building new buildings. So we need to achieve a huge shift in investment from some categories of the some sectors of the economy to others and from high carbon to zero low carbon technologies and obviously therefore finance has a huge task to do in supporting that very big shift in investment whether it in debt or equity or various mezzanine forms and it's therefore very welcome that many financial institutions as well as companies and countries are now making net zero commitments. We see, for instance, the Net Zero Asset Owners uh, Alliance. And we have within our Energy Transition Commission, uh, companies like Allianz uh, on the asset management side, HSBC uh, on the lending side, uh, banking side, who are making commitments to be net zero compatible in their strategies. But that raises the question, which many of these institutions are now asking, what does it mean for an asset manager or a bank to be committed to be net zero by 2050? After all, the, most the least important bit of this story is the energy they use themselves. Obviously, they have to make sure that in their own operations, they are zero carbon, but that's the least important thing. What matters is what they invest in and who they lend to. So what do they specifically have to do today in terms of who they lend to and who they invest in to make it compatible with a zero carbon uh, a future? Clearly, they must avoid simplistic points of view. If you were to look at the carbon intensity of a company that you lent money to, you would say, well, this retailer or this law firm or uh, this entertainment company, this has a low carbon output per revenue, per euro of revenue. So that looks better than a steel mill, which has a high carbon output uh, per revenue. And you might say, well, I'm going to therefore not uh, lend to the steel mill. But somebody has to produce the steel. Uh, at the moment, the only way that we have equipment in place now produces carbon. And somebody's got to... In invest in those steel companies or lend to those companies for them to reinvest in the new low carbon assets. 
So it's quite a difficult thing to actually work out how to be net zero. We are now in the Energy Transition Commission engaged with many of our financial institution member companies to answer that particular question. And we find that it's most useful to think in terms of a set of distinct challenges by sector which a financial institution will find in the sectoral breakdown uh, of its lending portfolio or its asset portfolio. Uh, first, there are multiple sectors where actually the financial institution has a relatively small role to play in driving the move to zero carbon. If you think about the healthcare sector, education, entertainment, hospitality, these are sectors where energy is a small percentage of total value added. Essentially, the energy input tends to be almost entirely electricity. The crucial thing is to decarbonize the electricity source. Financiers are not financing major energy using equipment by these sectors. And the role of finance here is not fundamental. What fundamentally matters is government regulation and government strategies towards the deregulation, the decarbonization of the power system so that in 20 years time, all the electricity that these sectors are using is zero carbon. So what do financiers need to do? Well, they can, if they want, say, we have decided in over our own operations to only use renewable electricity. And we want our customers to do that and we encourage them to do that. And we support decarbonization of the power sector uh, across the economy. But on the whole, it doesn't get more complicated than that. When you switch to major energy using sectors such as steel, cement, mining, plastics, shipping, we deal here with sectors where energy is a large percentage of input costs and where financiers, whether they are equity investors or lenders, are actually providing the funds which will support long lasting and in some ways irreversible investment decisions. Decisions to invest in a ship in 2025, which will still be carrying cargo on the sea in 2050. So here what financial institutions need to do is be very clear what is the feasible sectoral roadmap which takes steel or aviation or shipping from high carbon today to zero carbon by 2050 and to commit that they will support that roadmap and they will support companies which are on that roadmap, but they will not support companies which are not on that roadmap. And that will mean, for instance, saying to a steel company which wants to build a new steel mill, if you want to build this new steel mill as a coking coal steel mill without carbon capture and storage, we are not going to finance that because we know that we will be investing in a stranded asset. There is then a very important sector for companies, which is real estate and construction. And we sometimes don't focus enough on this. It is true that if you look at the lending portfolios of almost all major banks in the world, you will find that over 50% is lending to real estate, either residential or commercial, or to construction. And that reflects the fact that within modern economies, a large percentage of the total asset base and of all capitalist investment is in real estate and other forms of physical building infrastructure. So it is very important for financial institutions to have a strategy towards that. And that strategy needs to involve two focuses. One, the carbon intensity of the building process itself, because buildings are intensive of cement, and of steel. And cement and steel are both carbon intensive commodities. So basically, being clear that you are only willing to finance construction, which is minimizing the use of steel or cement, using it as efficiently as possible, and preferably favoring the use of steel, which is lower carbon and eventually zero carbon, and same with cement. This is a very important role for financial institutions. There are then sectors of 
end consumer goods manufacturers, which are either carbon intensive in use, such as the internal co co uh, combustion engine, or in production, such as fashion goods. And here again, one needs inst financial institutions to engage with what is the clear roadmap of how those institutions, uh, how those companies in 20 years time or preferably earlier are selling products like electric vehicles, which are not Merci. carbon intensive use or selling fashion and clothing, which is not carbon intensive of production. And again, being clear, how are they going to favor the low carbon routes, not the high carbon? Merci, Dr. Mer. Finally, of course, there's the energy sector itself. There is a huge need to support investment in zero carbon energy, massive investment in green electrification. The only way to a zero carbon economy is to build an economy which uses about four to five times as much electricity as it does at the moment to electrify the whole of the economy. That means massive investment in renewable electricity, including in developing markets where there is a fundamental problem of too high a cost of capital. And finally, there is the issue of an approach to Merci the fossil fuel companies. Thank you, sir. We have to, we have to stop here. Planned reductions in fossil fuels. That requires a criteria for project finance, no new coal mining or coal power investments, no high cost oil and gas production, no investments ideally in oil and gas exploration. Because our big problem is we've already got more oil and gas than we can possibly produce safely. We don't need to find more. But also criteria for favoring some categories of companies. And here financiers should support those oil and gas companies which have already committed to credible paths to be net zero by 2050. And I would put Shell and Total and BP in that category of people who are making credible and real commitments. And I could name, but I will not name, but you can probably guess a few other oil and gas companies which have made no such commitments and at the moment don't appear to intend to. So what I've tried to give a feel for is what is the financing challenge and how does a financial institution, whether it be an equity asset manager or a lender, think about what it has to do to be helping this ecological. There are then, therefore, uh, in addition, a set of issues for regulators and the public policy about whether one can help and cajole and encourage and incent uh, financial institutions in that direction through central bank stress tests, through adjustments of risk weights, through the willingness of central banks in quantitative easing operations only to buy the bonds of companies uh, which are being uh, more responsible or by the definition of what counts as a green bond. And I think some of the other speakers will talk about those specific possible levers. Merci beaucoup, but Lord I hope it's been Turner, useful that I've tried to provide an overview of what a responsible financial absolument. institution needs to do to drive us towards this energy transition. Thank you very much. Merci, Lord Turner, et c'était... Thank you, Lord Turner. It was very comprehensive and very com compelling. Uh, Lord Turner raised uh, several aspects. Maya Atiga, for example, about how banks are going to bring their financial support to this uh, energy transition. Can you explain to us how banks are supporting their customers in this process? Thank you. Maya, I'd just like to point out that you Director General of the uh, French Banking Federation. Yes, thank you, uh, Emmanuel. What uh, Jean-Paul uh, Poulain is saying that uh, the banks have the power and the, it is in their interest to support this energy transition. What Lord Turner is showing us is that companies and households have that power too, and it's also in their interest. And in reality, and if we look at uh, on the Paris uh, market, with the financial markets, all of its uh, components, uh, management and insurance, etc. If we look at what they've committed to in 2019, it was simply to be a forerunner in the transition and to send a strong signal of mobilization to the public and private players. Economists like to talk about signals. 
And it's very important here. The idea that the energy transition is everybody's business, the inner environmental transition with all of its dimension in, is, is everybody's business. Now, have to support the stakeholders in the transformation of their energy mix and of their business model is something that uh, is something very much present in the bank strategy today. It's a, it's a guarantee of a sustainable performance. We've moved on from a world where the environment and the ecology and the environment were in parallel to a world where we very much believe that finance has to show that it is open to all of these projects and has to say to the customers, what you will, whatever you do to, uh, in favour of energy transition to serve up what Mr. Turner was saying, that the paths can be very different. Some can be faster than others, depending on your starting point, depending on your technology. Everything that customers will do, particularly companies in that area, whatever they do, they will find the funding they need to do that. This is a very strong message. Of course, in the rest of the round table, we will see that implementation is very complex. But I believe that the message is very simple. The French banks are moving in that direction. The banks are the mirror <coughs> of the economy. They work in the economy as it is. And this mirror, the reflection in the mirror, is going to gradually change. If we look at uh, credits to companies in France, we've got 1.2 billion uh, credits to uh, French companies. A lot of these credits can be identified as uh, moving towards energy transition. Some of these credits are not assigned, not allocated. Let me take a very uh, clear example. The loans with the government guarantee, we're going to have 100 billion uh, euros of uh, loans. We've already gone beyond that. A lot of major companies have made sure they have the commitments that enable them to move in towards this energy transition. Everybody can see what I'm talking about, whether it's Air France or Renault. A lot of uh, very small companies, 80% of our beneficiaries are very small enterprises. A lot of these companies have done this to pay their employees, to pay the rents. You can't say to them, oh, well, no, an employee uh, salary isn't green. We can't pay f help you pay for it. No, that's not how it works. So I think it's very important that all of this very detailed work and as uh, uh, previous speakers have said, there's a lot of nuances, there's a lot of subtleties here. But binary approaches which are saying green or not green is not going to work. We have to look at the path and the dynamic. And this uh, dynamic is underway, whether it's uh, energy renovation, SMEs or very small enterprises. Just a few examples of banks' commitment in this area. Very clear commitment to uh, move out of coal, which has been published by many French banks. Coal is not just coal production, it's also companies that make high use of, great deal of use of coal. Here again, there's a simple idea and uh, the implementation, which is complicated in terms of methodology. So the uh, implementation takes account of that complexity. The second commitment is support for transformation in uh, customers' businesses. Third commitment is to continue to change the portfolios with methodologies that have to be defined. With, with again, the methodologies are complex, but the idea is simple. When the measures are taken, we have to uh, be able to assess the impact, and a lot of people are in charge of managing that complexity for us as banks. We want to give this signal that we are there to support customers. And fourth idea is scientific rigor and collective rigor. There's a Finance for Tomorrow observatory in the French market, which is being put in place with a scientific committee, which will be the guarantor of the rigor of all of this. So to sum up, French banks have a challenge, which is to support this transition in an inclusive way. They have one strength which is their financing capacity, their solidity, and access to liquidity and innovation capacity. They have very highly committed teams for whom it is very important to show that the banks are ready to meet the needs of the society and economy. And these commitments have to be kept to over a long period of time and we have to manage these uh, dynamics. So a lot of leaders in the, uh, we have a lot of French leaders in the environment and the financing of uh, the green economy. Thank you, uh, Maya. So we're talking about the uh, economy and asset management. Uh, how do we find our way through this uh, jungle of, uh, of green savings? Before we move on to the jungle, 
I think we, if you're talking about uh, putting finance at the service of the ecological transition, first of all, we have to say it's absolutely vital. If you look uh, at uh, France, we, we've, we've invested 30 billion in energy transition. We want to keep to our commitments. We're talking about 60 or 70 billion in the future. So it's absolutely vital. The good news is that finance is almost ready. On one side, we have the issuers who've uh, realized they have an important role to play in this environmental transition and are looking for means to finance it because it's very costly. And we can see very clearly all of the efforts that are made in terms of extra financial reporting. Most remarkable thing is the, the progress made by the investors. We have uh, 300,000 investors, 3,000 investors uh, have uh, signed the United Nations Responsible Investment uh, Charter. We have uh, had a lot of uh, announcements by major asset managers, uh, particularly BlackRock, in my opinion, because of personal conviction from their leaders, also because of the investment strategy one they want to put in place. Not because you have to demonstrate that a green investment is more profitable than another. That has to be the subject of a debate. But the risk of investing products that are not green has certainly increased considerably. We know that an investor invests taking account of risk and profitability. From that point of view, the role of uh, central banks, particularly the Bank uh, of France, Banque de France, which includes in its micro prudential approach and macro prudential role, takes account of this energy transition risk. This has no doubt encouraged these uh, stakeholders to change their attitude. We have issuers already, the investors are ready, and we have uh, sellers and buyers who are ready. We have plenty of savings. What we need is our market. That's what's missing. And we need to have a market that is, whether it's financial or not financial, you have to correctly define the products and the players. So the subject of labeling is important. And that's where there is a problem. Today, we have extra financial reporting frameworks that are very different from one country to another. And we have a proliferation of different uh, players in, involved in labeling, whether it's standardization or product ratings. I've uh, found about more than 100 around the world. So at the end of the day, we can see that for issuers, it's very complex and costly to produce ESG information that is not standardized, but it's even more difficult for investors to get an idea of what you called the 50 shades of green and to avoid greenwashing. I'll end with uh, the fact that the, at the same time the European Commission has announced a major environmental investment program, it has also announced two other things. It has announced a major uh, program for taxonomy of green investments. And the second subject which is being opened up is the definition of a, an ESG reporting framework. And I think that uh, it's neither the Americans or the Chinese are going to be able to do that. Europe is capable of getting a step ahead in this area of no standardization. I think if we can do that, that will make it possible for the market to fully function. Let's hope so, because it's complicated to find our way. We can look at the issue from another point of view. Another piece of the jigsaw puzzle, uh, the EQE. You are a lawyer at Allen and Overy. Concerning regulation in terms of uh, sustainable financing, have we made progress? Do you think we've come done? Is there still a lot of a uh, long way to go? Thank you, Emmanuel. I think we have come some of the way. If we look at the texts, there's a proliferation of different texts, which were incentives uh, with the best in class approach. And gradually, we are starting to move towards texts which are to be uh, obligatory. Well, we, this isn't the case, yes. The problem is a systemic problem. As has been said, it's not sufficient for a label or for a standard to be imposed in Europe. It has to be imposed uh, internationally. In a situation where we have a systemic problem, an organization that manages this systemic problem has to be the first to intervene. I would like to mention the rules that have been established in, in 2015, the objectives defined by the General Assembly of the UN in 2015 which defined uh, sustainable development objectives in three dimensions, economic, social, and environmental. 
we talked about the environmental aspect, there's also social and economic uh, aspect as well, which are also very important. Of course, you're familiar with the commitments that were made as part of the Paris Agreement. A number of experts were brought together by the European Union to decide upon and to regulate this area because if the rules aren't clear and are not uh, obligatory, they cannot be followed. And it's impossible for an issuer, when you're a lawyer, when you want to, when you, uh, you're advising a customer, you, you want the rules to be clear. You want somebody to explain to you what has to be done. And above all, you want somebody to explain to you how you can track and monitor the commitment you have made. Today, it's important for you not to be just to be judged on the commitments that uh, a particular entity will make based on some kind of advertising. The rules have to be clear. Fortunately, the European Commission, as every LAS has said, and Europe and France in particular, has played a leading role in this area. And there's a regulation that was adopted in Europe on the 18th of June, which uh, defines a framework aiming to encourage uh, sustainable investment. It's the first European framework. Why have we decided to use this technical text, a European legislation? Is it directly at in, uh, imposed in all of the European countries. Then you have to have a number of other delegated texts to specify the different elements included in this regulation. But we're talking about a European framework which will be the same throughout the European Union. This text is very interesting uh, because, first of all, because it applies to the European Union itself and it applies to the member states, therefore, and it will also apply to the financial establishments as my attic mentioned, and also to the distributors of financial products and also to uh, outside Europe as well. Tomorrow when you have a life insurance portfolio, or you're an asset manager or you're an insurance company, you will have to say what proportion is green, which proportion is sustainable, and what proportion is, is social. This is a very interesting text, very useful, because it will clearly define concepts which are rather either intuitive, which are a bit vague. Today we have a definition of, of what a sustainable investment is. We have a definition of what is not sustainable. There are lots of different definitions. Is, is nuclear power green? Other assets which are transition assets. The previous speakers have also mentioned the need to have this transition. The text is useful because it says there are a number of criteria that are obviously green. For others, we need to have a transition an entity which has high carbon uh, activity needs to be financed, but it needs to have more time. If you're an airline company or, uh, or um, automobile manufacturer, you need time. And uh, for example, I remember an operation uh, that was made by the post office who were issuing green bonds to finance acquisition of uh, green vehicles to deliver mail in France. So you see, this is a transition phase for a number of activities. If we look at the text, I'll stop in a moment so we have time for the debate. If we look at the text, what is interesting is that we're starting to move towards something is more and more uh, defined in greater and greater detail. And this is the case in France with uh, our green laws. Today, legal experts and jurists are a little bit lost because there are many different texts which are nested together and perhaps not so well. But we don't have many things that are uh, obligatory, the European Union regulation I mentioned. Some of the objectives it defines, which will become obligatory in January 2022, others in January 2023, but that's only the beginning for a certain number of regulations. So that's very useful. We've made a big step forward, but there's lots of work still to do. So things are moving forward fairly quickly then. Things are changing. OK, we'll finish uh, the going talking to our different guests because we're saying things are changing quite quickly. But we mustn't forget the fundamentals of uh, bankers or financiers' uh, business. When you invest, it's to make sure you get a return on your investment. We have some conflicts here in terms of horizons <coughs> between the short term and the long term. This is what Christian Gaulier was saying at the end of the month. Is it the end of the month or the end of the world? Sylvie Matara, how can we make sure that banks are able to offer this kind of uh, financial product? 
whereas we can see there's a problem of uh, profitability and that the bank has to comply with certain requirements in terms of profitability. Yes, absolutely. It's quite easy to agree that this transition is vital. I think it's quite easy to also to agree that the banks are the naturally the vehicle to finance that. But then the bankers have to have an interest in uh, participating and they have uh, uh, a need for profitability, especially in the environment we are living in today. And the regulations have changed over the years and they've become more and more uh, restrictive and uh, more and more uh, obligations. Yes, they have a uh, need for profitability and they're being pressurized by their shareholders. And they also have to uh, be able to um, get a benefit from uh, their actions. So there uh, is a problem of horizons. The work of intermediation is a work that the bank uh, carries out. In the medium term, we need, the banks need to see how they can reasonably decide to orient their financing towards this kind of objective because uh, on the stock exchange, the shareholders are there and they tend to judge the uh, actions of uh, business leaders in the short term. So I think we need to put in place incentives. We talked about a number of incentives through regulations, which will consist in obliging uh, institutions to publish a certain information that is not financial, uh, linked to uh, the compliance uh, with uh, green obligations. There's a lot of uh, legislation in this area. When you're a banker, it's difficult to know exactly what you have to publish. But more or less, we know that we have to regularly publish this type of information, that the shareholders are very uh, interested in this, and the investment funds are very interested in this as well, and customers too. And I would say even the employees of the company are also very interested in this. So it's very important for the bank's image. And today, the bank's image has an undeniable impact on its uh, uh, share price. So everything concerning non-financial, extra-financial information, provided it's clear and is harmonized throughout Europe and also in the G20 countries, for me, this is a positive uh, development because it encourages banks to be more transparent about what they do. And when they're more transparent, people uh, and investors and uh, rating agencies can get a clearer idea about the quality of what the uh, products. The second incentive, which is very, very direct, because it is more something that is also the heart of daily management of a bank, which is its consumption of capital. And here the prudential regulations have a role to play. John Paul has mentioned this. It's also the uh, decision that is made by the, in, the in network for agreeing the financial system in the NFGS that the, where the Banque de France plays an important role. The idea is to orient the financial regulations to make sure that consumption of capital goes more towards investments uh, uh, and credits and loans that are green. And here, I think it would be more beneficial to, to penalize non-green uh, investors rather than to incent give incentives to green investors, because the fundamental point is risk. Today, the risk of uh, funding non-green products is very high. And here I'm talking about, about reputational risk. Here, here, this is something that people will know about and will have an impact on the uh, reputation of a bank today, and which will indirectly, but very certainly, will have an impact on the appreciation of investors and will have an impact on the share price. So the bankers are there to fund. Maya has said there's a lot of uh, financing that is available, but uh, the financiers have to get the return, and the, to do that, they have to have profitability, and for that, they need to have immediate incentives. Je vous pose ma première. Well, let me ask me the first question and then I'll present the, I'll, the questions that have been submitted on the internet. There's quite a lot of them. So we get the impression that we try to do a lot to encourage investment in uh, ecological transition, in uh, green, whatever is green. But it seems that uh, for the whatever is non-green, there's no future. So if you don't invest in something that's heading towards ecological transition, you're taking a huge risk. So don't you think that's the best incentive, really, to aim at uh, to 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 go towards uh, the funding of green economy? Because if you f uh, invest in a non-green economy, it's very risky. Jean-Paul Poulain. Yes, it is true. Nevertheless, 
The risks you're talking about are difficult to define. What uh, Sylvie said about the risks, this reference uh, to prudential regulations uh, that banks are uh, have to abide by uh, uh, today uh, is something. But the risks that we have are shocks, small shocks over a long term that can turn into huge systemic shocks, if you want. Uh, but uh, in a way, it's a small thing. Uh, subprimes were not that big, in fact, but we know the impact uh, they had. In the case of ecological transition, the risks we're talking about are not something that can be translated into probabilities. They are a huge risk, and they are rare, scarce. So if only on this problem, it's a bit difficult to define rules based on that. These uh, risks are specific. There's the famous uh, uh, black signals, except that now we talk about uh, green signal when we talk about these big, uh, the, these major risks. But whatever the case, we don't know uh, the future. So obviously, the issue of uh, short-term uh, return is uh, is still there. Very often, the financial world was accused to be short-termist and to look at the short term. So it's true there's uh, incentives uh, for the long term, except, uh, as Keynes uh, used to say, individuals will all be dead in the long term. So. There is a sort of a contrary arguments or reverse arguments. Sylvie Matera, yes, I agree that uh, theoretically it's difficult to quantify and measure these risks, and it's difficult to integrate them into standards. But nevertheless, in real life, these risks are a sure thing. When you are funding a coal plant, the risk is that uh, you might end up on the first page of the newspaper and uh, uh, your customers wouldn't be happy, your staff uh, won't really be happy, they will be wondering whether uh, they're working for the right bank. When you go and buy your bread, uh, people tell you, you know, you're funding uh, these coal plants, it's not a good thing. So these uh, risks uh, for your reputation are very important because they have an impact on the view of your establishment by the public and therefore on your uh, your stock, uh, your stock price, and on the va your brand value as well, your brand image. Yes, but I guess that the stock price is the best summary. Well, I agree, says Mr. Ecuy. If we expect the objectives defined by the regulations, uh, obviously all the highly carbonated, the carbonized uh, activities will be less profitable. So oh, there's a uh, regulation in France that is going to force progressively uh, the uh, companies to uh, to uh, apply stress tests. Uh, so we're heading towards a measurable uh, uh, element that will enable us to quantify uh, the risk. Mayati. Yes, one of the issues is to say what is non-green today. Uh, some things are obviously green. A few years ago, buying a diesel company, was it a, a green uh, choice or not? Uh, it's quite easy today to say what is good and not good, but I, it's more difficult to say what will not be good in five years. So between this green and non-green aspects, you have technologies and uses that are going to change. Let's take an example, scooters, uh, they uh, are, can be a problem, uh, they can be le more green than a car, but uh, it's not the only thing that should be taken into account. But uh, diesel fuel was green 10 years ago, we considered it uh, as less polluting, while now it's considered as more polluting. Yes, you have to be uh, very demanding and you have to listen to specialists uh, 
uh, uh, to see for all these categories, how does it shift from one category to the other? If I may come back to the issue of risks, you have very long-term risk. We all know that if uh, climate warms, uh, the uh, sea level will rise and uh, all the uh, buildings uh, along the shores will be at risk. But you have other risks. Some assets might not be eligible for the refunding by central banks tomorrow. When a huge, big uh, uh, Chinese cities decided two years ago that they wouldn't have one uh, diesel car uh, driving along the roads, there was an immediate big, uh, impact. So regulations have an immediate impact, and we can see that this is what investors are integrating more and more. I can't uh, hide the fact that we have a lot of questions about this, the sincerity of the approach uh, by companies and the financial sector. So uh, Jean-Luc Gaffard is sending us a question. Isn't there an issue of governance uh, uh, in companies? Are they sincere in their uh, greening approach? Uh, uh, don't you think they should be incentivized more? Well, I would say it's not the real discussion. Is there an approach or not? Then the reasons why, uh, uh, well, Sylvie has talked about some banks that are uh, just looking at their uh, stock price and some are not listed companies, but they're still aiming at the same thing. So the reason why is not that important. I'll be very pragmatic, practical about that. If they have the approach and the approach is uh, scientific and rigorous and, and strict, the fact that they did it in the beginning because they wanted to avoid a bad image or because they, they were really convinced is not important. The important thing is to know what is done and uh, the fact that what is done is not just a fad, but it's a continuous approach. And that's the most important. Uh, the, I observe, uh, I've been observing companies uh, for 20 years and more, and I've seen a real change. Uh, 10 years ago, <coughs> Uh, the ecological issue, environmental issue uh, in a board of directors uh, was presented by associations. Now it's spontaneously mentioned by uh, corporate leaders. So it's a new way also of m making sure of the sustainability of the company, and but it's also a real conviction of the managers. And there's also the imp the the. The, the fact that uh, the staff is more and more concerned about that, it's something they challenge their managements about. And so the uh, sin sincerity may be a moral issue, but it's important for the continuity of action, and it's something that everybody wants. Yes, but it goes at a par with uh, profitability. We could say in a somewhat provocative way that it's the huge, uh, fabulous plasticity of capitalism. Uh, we know that uh, for part of this green economy, there's a philosophy of uh, uh, ungrowth and uh, uh, leaving capitalism. But the strength of capitalism is to adapt to all these challenges. Yes, but the plasticity you're mentioning doesn't come from the market. It's not just the market incentive. Uh, I know that my friend uh, uh, from GAFA uh, is skeptic about that, but uh, it's, a, it's a collective approach uh, based on consultations, consultations, and maybe a change of viewpoint. Uh, from uh, on the part of the staff and a cultural change, I would say. So I do believe that in this instance, capitalism will adapt, not because there are market signals that they can uh, catch. I'm not saying that these signals are not pertinent. But this won't be the reason why they won't do it because the market wants them to, but uh, they will also do it because there's a true internal will to change things and to apply this capitalisms of uh, stakeholders. And uh, uh, obviously there are announcements and fads, but uh, 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 if you look at what happened in the U.S., 
with uh, the round table that went along those lines, or the Senar Nota report, they make sense. Uh, they are a true reality. And uh, also, we could maybe say that the multi Simplicity of offers, even though they may not all be sincere, the fact that uh, there are so many is a reflection of the fact that it is a general concern. If I may add something, in fact, the sincerity uh, of uh, the approach is not that important. The important thing is that if you use a label, it has to be a strong label. If I come back to the regulations, if you look at a topic I like very much, biodiversity, you have a text defining very clearly what biodiversity means and how, and make sure that the, the funds uh, the financing goes to the right uh, biodiversity activities. So if you say, okay, I'm funding an act, um, uh, activity uh, in biodiversity, you have to check that it is uh, uh, truly uh, abiding by the rules and standards. Yes, but uh, how uh, do you, if you're a bank or a fund manager, how can you make sure of all these labels, what they mean, what they reflect? And if I'm saving, if I'm, uh, uh, how can I pick the sector I'm going to invest in? If I'm very interested in biodiversity, uh, if I'm saving money, I don't know where to put my money. Let me come back to the, the previous issue, which is that of profitability, because capitalism cannot be dissociated from this issue of profitability. And there's been quite a lot of uh, research to see whether green investments were uh, profitable. And over the long term, the companies that have uh, an, uh, the right approach have developed uh, well and probably better than others. Now, the difficult thing is uh, the uh, uh, investment horizon. Is it a long one or a short one? And it's true that green funding is uh, more of a long-term investment. If I take the example, Mayati, uh, the example of uh, green bonds, well, we do have questions about these bonds and their usefulness. When they were launched, uh, they, they meant, OK, we're going to fund a company producing electricity, and the money uh, that uh, is received from this bond emission will be used for these uh, this funding. In the beginning, there was no real frame. It was based on uh, contracts, but there were some criticisms because it was said, OK, such and such company didn't use all the funds for this. But it didn't last long. Uh, things went very quickly. So first step, as you said, the capitalism creates the new market. And, uh, and step two, regulations are introduced rather quickly through questions, the sophistication of the uh, inner uh, operation of the company that can uh, direct better, guarantee better, using the advice of banks. And uh, uh, today, the market, and uh, today we have a considerable market with an additional uh, uh, 110 billion euros of euro credit for that. Uh, but uh, the French uh, banks uh, have a larger part uh, than uh, in these emissions than they have in other bond issues. So it's a very uh, positive market. And this green label is much more uh, structured. In fact, when the French state uh, did uh, make its uh, Green bond emissions, uh, it took uh, several months to guarantee that it was a solid emission. And uh, around that, um, other products are created with more blurry indications to show that there's a place for others. I think we shouldn't work too fast. Uh, uh, it's a very complex t topic. Uh, texts are changing, uh, procedures evolve. And today, when someone emits a bond, they must uh, uh, say, first of all, uh, what project they're going to fund. And if uh, uh, the investment and the funded project are not back to back, how are, are not used? Uh, so uh, 
we can see uh, how how the funds can be used for another project, for example. So I think we should take our time. Those who uh, check the text, monitor the text, realize how complex it is, but the system will improve. One word about uh, the savings attribution of French people. They say that pe French people have a lot of savings account. Okay, you have the sustainable development uh, uh, account, but I challenge you to tell me what's inside. But why not a green savings account? <laughs> to give it to profitability. It won't, it can't, it won't earn less than a livre savings plan, surely. There are... Um, Tax incentive uh, schemes are very important in that area. When you buy uh, an electric bulb today, you know whether it's A, B, C, D, E, or F in terms of efficiency. We have to have the same thing for a green product. Today, when you define uh, carbon uh, consumption index, I'm not sure whether in all countries we have the same definition or the same measurements. So there's a lot of standardization which is required, and that will take a lot of time if this is something the European Commission has started to do. And on that basis, we will gradually have a taxonomy and a measurement of the uh, level of greenness of the different products. Where are we at uh, at the moment? Here I have another question. When we look at the changes in different uh, share prices in the sector, there's no sign of greening of finance. Finance is working for transition of environmental transition. Isn't it just wishful thinking? You're right. We can't force the situation to change. To get to significant amounts, uh, to have a considerable uh, weight uh, in the index, it's going to take time because there's a lot of inertia in the market. I think the tendency is very positive. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody wants to do it. All of the banks want to finance this kind of investment. They are all trying to understand in this jungle of uh, regulations what they have to do, what are their obligations, and what is binding upon them. But uh, I'm sure that it will happen. We have to leave the market a little bit of time to self-regulate, as Maya said. It's is what we've seen in history, and the banks are aware of this. There's also a question of, uh, in uh, economy, you like to talk about flows and stocks. We've talked about energy renovation, for example. Who knows today what is the energy performance of their housing, where they live, if they haven't bought it very recently? I have no idea. If it was five, more than five or ten years ago, you have no idea. The indicator you have is your electricity bill. You have a, a credit, Emmanuel. Have you gone to your bank and say, have you said to them, you know, that the uh, drilling you helped me buy, do you know what level of, uh, what level of en environmental level it's at? So you have a credit portfolio, you have a lot of assets in this portfolio which are high energy performance, but the information is not available. One of the difficulties in defining this classification, the taxonomy, and this is a complexity I mentioned earlier, one of the difficulties is to looking at the stock of credits and loans we have now and to reallocate the level of uh, environmental value they have. I absolutely agree. You have 30 billion euros of investment in France in the environmental interest, and a third from the state, a third from the private individuals, and a third from the businesses. For enterprises and individuals, this is financed by savings or by banks. So this transition is already in the bank's portfolios or the investors or the asset managers' portfolios, but it is not earmarked, it is not identified. It's not enough to say you can't say that you haven't started to green the finance. It's started to happen for a long time already. But in 10 years' time, will it actually be meaningful when we have green finance everywhere? As Maya was saying, finance is a mirror of the economy. The economy is moving towards a green economy. The finance will finance that economy. So it will happen quite naturally. So, Jean-Paul, uh, it's a problem of transition that we have then. Yes. What, uh, this is what we've learned from this roundtable. We have to emphasize the transition. What I believe is that spontaneously there is a desire to enter into this transition. I repeat what I said in my introduction. I believe, nevertheless, that we need to have incentives that are centralized, whether they come from the regulator or elsewhere. And from that point of view, 
the environmental policies up to now have perhaps not been uh, up to the mark. Uh, talking about the price of carbon for many years, carbonists have been talking about the price of carbon. We know that today the market is insignificant. It's uh, not at all at the scale that is necessary to have an impact on this uh, transition, this energy transition. So the regulator has a lot of work to do to make sure uh, it works. We can see there's a kind of unanimous uh, point of view from the institutions and finance and uh, the government. But we do have to have some sort of inter intervention by the central regulator. We uh, a last question from a web user. Is if green finance a luxury for rich countries, just for rich countries? I don't think so. Quite honestly, when you, I was talking about biodiversity, it's not a luxury, there's only for rich countries. If you have to satisfy the requirements, you have no choice. Biodiversity, no. What about finance? I think the reality is that gradually, as you were saying, gradually we will all start to finance these assets. You were talking about incentives earlier. One part of the regulation that is interesting is that it says eventually uh, those who do not comply with these labels will have to make a declaration. So you have to comply or explain. Gradually we're going to move towards that situation. Is it uh, an issue uh, or something that's only for rich countries? I don't believe so. It's a systemic uh, issue. It's not really a luxury. It should be a question of guilt for rich countries because it so happens that uh, today we are requiring all of the countries to meet these uh, standards. But we have to be clear that the accumulation of CO2 and greenhouse gases has uh, essentially been caused by rich countries. who have uh, It is they who have contributed to it. And it's up to them today to do the job to carry out this transition. Whereas we can ask emerging countries to to, uh, to do an equivalent piece of work, whereas they're not responsible for the stock that, of the CO2. I'm a little less optimistic. I think it's a very good question that has been asked. And it's true that today we've all said this transition will have a cost, an immediate cost, although the uh, benefit will be in the longer term. And some countries aren't necessarily in a situation to make that choice. Uh, for me, uh, the possibility to have that choice is a luxury. I'm thinking of some countries, for example, regions of Germany, if you don't finance coal, there won't be any jobs. So it's a very good question. It's a debate that is taking place everywhere. The African Development Bank that has uh, provided uh, green finance and is very interested in all of these issues, they are financing southern countries in this area. It's vital for everybody. We had a large proportion of the activity of French banks internationally could be financing of uh, wind turbines uh, uh, in certain uh, areas of developing countries. That's one of the innovative types of financing that is taking place. Jean-Paul Ballin, up to you now to give us a conclusion. To conclude, I would say that we've been very consensual. There hasn't been any disagreement between us, maybe not enough, perhaps. Everybody seems to agree with each other. Is it a good thing or not? I don't know. I could have said to Maya, you're saying that French banks are doing a great deal, but uh, if you look at the figures, it's tiny compared to what they should be doing. We could have said it, but anyway, we said it now. No, we all agree that uh, there's a common desire and a determination to uh, carry out this transition. The financial sector, as it's in the front line, no doubt it is the sector that is most uh, closely concerned here, and it has to contribute. I think it's a good thing that we have highlighted this uh, concept of a transition. The idea is not to move from zero to 100%. The journey that we have to enter into is a journey 
that represents progress from one situation to another, perhaps by in smaller steps uh, in some cases and in a larger steps in others, depending on the sector and the industry that is uh, concerned. That's what I've learned from uh, what we've been saying to each other this morning. I think uh, the uh, what we're aiming for is fairly clear, but uh, the question of how we get there and what is uh, what needs to be done, it's very complicated. There's a lot of work to do. It's very complicated. Thank you very much, everybody. Maya Atig, General Director of the uh, French Banking Federation, Sylvie Matara, who's an uh, advisor to the EU Commission on Capital Market, and Lord uh, Adair Turner, who was with us by video conference, uh, Elias Hervé, Evie Elias from uh, Mazas, and Evie Ecué from the Allen & Overy uh, legal firm. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. Thank you.